Sutra. Upali arose from his seat, bowed at the Buddha's feet, and said to the Buddha, I followed the Buddha in person when he fled the city and left the home life. I observed the first come one and your six years of diligent asceticism. I watched the first come one subdue all the demons, control adherents of external paths, and become liberated from all our flaws which were based on worldly desire and greed. Commentary Upali is foremost in holding the precepts. His name means superior leader Shang Shou. He never committed the slightest infraction of the precepts spoken by the Buddha. His lay name was Chana. He was with the Buddha when he left the place and went into the mountains. He was extremely familiar with all the events of the Buddha's life because he was the person who had followed the Buddha the longest. When the five bishops left the Buddha, Upali did not leave. He stayed by his side and served Shakyuni Buddha as he cultivated the way. Yupali arose from his seat, bowed at the Buddha's feet, and said to the Buddha, I followed the Buddha in person when he fled the city and left the home life. At that time, Yupali, who was then Chana, first accompanied the Buddha to the eastern gate of the city. The Buddha, who was then a prince, went out looking for some excitement because he was bored in the palace. At the gate, he observed a woman by the side of the road giving birth to a child. She was weeping and wailing and threatening in pain. The prince asked Chana, What's going on? Why is she crying so violently? When Chana told him, he was shocked to find that birth involved so much suffering. After the child was born, the prince was upset and said, we are going back. I don't want to go sightseeing today. The next day, they went to the southern gate to do some more sightseeing. There they saw an old person. His head shook. His vision was blurred. His teeth had fallen out, and he could hardly walk. The prince asked Chana, What kind of person is that? That person is very old. Oh, was his reply. What's uh, that's what getting old is like. That's too much suffering. And once again, he didn't want to go any further. The third day, he went to the western gate. There, he saw a sick person afflicted with an ugly and violent disease. Why is that person in such a horrible shape? asked the prince. That person is sick, was Chana's reply. Once again, the principal was troubled and did not want to travel further. The fourth day, they went to the northern gate and came across a person who had just died. When the prince asked about him, Chana told him that that was what death was like. The prince was stunned and at having seen birth, old age, sickness, and death. At that moment, the monk walked by wearing a robe and such. When the prince saw him, he asked Chana what he was. Chana said, Ask him and find out. The prince who was to become Shakyamuni Buddha asked the monk, What do you do? I'm a person who has left the home life. What does that mean? asked the prince. People who leave the home life are called bishus. They leave home in order to escape the suffering of birth, old age, sickness, and death. Once we understand the way, then there is neither production nor extinction. We do not have to be born or die, and we can accomplish Buddhahood. Can you tell me how to leave home? asked the prince. Can you be my teacher? This picture was actually a god from the heaven of pure dwelling. Seeing that conditions were ripe, the god intentionally transformed himself to come take Shakyamuni Buddha across. When the prince asked the bishu to be his teacher, the monk beat his staff once on the ground ascended into space and entered the heavens. The prince had no way to study the path and no method for living home life, so he returned to the palace. Meanwhile, a prognosticator who looked at 
physiognomies told the king. If the prince does not leave for home in the next seven days, he will attain the position of a real turning king. He will rule over all the countries of the world. All you have to do is keep him here for a week. Thereupon his father, the pure rice king, took action and stationed his armed forces all around the palace to cut off all traffic in and out of the palace. A curfew prevailed and no one was allowed in or out of the palace. Thus the prince was surrounded and watched at all times. In this way, the pure rice king hoped that his son, Prince Siddhartha, would attain the position of a real turning king. A real turning king rules over the four great continents, Purva Viteha to the east, Jammu Gripa to the south, Abba Ragundinya to the west, and uh, Uttaraguru to the north. One world system is composed of one set of the four great continents, as well as one sun, one moon, and one Mount Sumeru. The thousand of these small world systems is called a middle-sized world system. One thousand middle-sized world systems is called a great world system. This is the meaning of the phrase three thousand great thousand world system. A wheel turning king rules over one small world system. The prince had extremely good rules, and so, although he was being watched, he did not become confused. The king sent many beautiful women to the quarters of the prince for him to enjoy, but the prince looked upon them with unseeing eyes. He listened with deaf ears. As it is said, the eyes see form, but inside there is nothing. The ears listen to sounds, but the mind is not aware of them. Or again, inside there is no body and mind, outside there is no world. Then the god from the heaven of pure dwelling appeared and spoke with the prince. Prince, are you so greedy for the pleasures of this world that you have forgotten your vows from former lives? Do you remember your past vows? Prince Siddhartha said, I haven't forgotten, but at present there's nothing I can do. The God from the heaven of pure dwelling said, If you have not forgotten and you still want to live the whole life and cultivate the way, I can help you. Excellent, said the prince. The God told Trana, that is Upali, whom we are now discussing, to prepare the horse, and the prince and Trana went to the back garden of the palace to escape. At that point, the four heavenly kings appeared and, each taking one of the horses legs, lifted up the horse, the prince and Upali into space and flew away with them. They mounted the clouds and rode the fog for three uranas and then alighted in the snowy mountains. The prince began to cultivate the way there in the mountains. As a response from the gods, there was a rise in Sisim there. And every day, Shakyamuni Buddha ate one grain of it to stay alive. Then three members of his father's clan and two members of his mother's clan came to cultivate there with him. Three could not take the ascetic practices and began to have doubts. Cultivation is too much suffering. When can we ever get to the Buddhas? Let's leave. These three left and went to the dear wine's park to cultivate the way. Eventually, the heavenly maiden brought an offering of milk gruel for the prince because he was nothing but skin and bones. After he drank the milk and gruel, his body began to fill out naturally. But the two who were still with him said he could take suffering, he couldn't take suffering. He could take suffering before, but now he can't. Now that he has drunk that milk and gruel, he won't have any accomplishment. He couldn't take it. Let's go. So the paternal relatives and maternal relatives all left. Only the venerable Upali remained. So he says, I followed the Buddha in person when he fled the city and left the home life. I was with him in the palace garden when he mounted the horse and flew out of the city. I observed the first common and six years of diligent ascetic season. 
For six years, he endured bitterness that is difficult to endure. I watched the first common subdue all the demons. The prince could have accomplished Buddha would right there on the snowy mountains, but he was concerned that people might mistakenly think that to accomplish Buddhahood you have to be a total ascetic. So he stopped meditating in the mountains and went to the Bodhi tree. He sat down beneath it and made a vow not to get up until he had become a Buddha. After the prince had sat there beneath the Bodhi tree for 48 days, the king of demons in the sixth desire heaven had a dream. He dreamed of 32 transformations when he awoke. Being able to reckon and contemplate, he looked into the reason for this strange dream and found that a Buddha, the Bodhisattva, was sitting beneath the Bodhi tree just about to accomplish Buddhahood. This will never do, he thought. I must find a way to destroy his concentration. He sent four demonic women, each of whom was exquisite. Demons are weird creatures, but they also dislike being ugly. They went to disturb Shakyamuni Buddha's samadhi by manifesting 32 enticing transformations. They were trying to seduce Shakyamuni Buddha. They wanted him to have an ordinary thought and thereby leave his samadhi. They wanted to arouse his desire, but the Buddha neither loved them nor desired them. Although he was not made of straw or rock, as the saying uh, as the saying goes. People aren't grass or old who doesn't have emotion. Yet, Shakyamuni Buddha could go through his experience and not be turned by it. He was not shaken by the demonic power of these women. He remained in a state of unmoving suchness. His mind did not move in the slightest. He did not give rise to love or desire. First, with this state, his thoughts did not arise. During this episode, Shakyamuni Buddha was contemplating impurity, similar to the contemplation of the nine aspects discussed above. He thought, Oh, you've come to treat me. Although you are beautiful now, you turn into skeletons. Your nine apertures are always oozing impurities. Your eyes ooze tears and matter. Your ears ooze wax. Your nose is have mucus, your mouths have a saliva and phlegm, all of is unclean, add to that is cremant and urine and you even feel here. Besides that, there are lots of germs in every part of your body, your entire bodies are full. His contemplation turned the four demonic women, women into old hags. They took a look at one another. Their skin was like a chicken's feet, and their hair was white as crane's. Their noses were dripping, and their mouths were drooling. They were total wrecks. They looked at one another and began to vomit, realizing that they had all become old and withered, and that they had no way to treat Shakyamuni Buddha. They left. Once the demon king saw that the four demon women had come back without success, he went with his demon sons and grandsons to kill Shakyamuni Buddha. But the Buddha was still unmoved. He wasn't afraid. He had entered the non-contention samadhi. If you move your mind, the demons will get you. If you don't move your mind, they can't get you. The demon couldn't disturb Shakyamuni Buddha. Also, an externalist master named Shen Chu put poison in some food and gave it to Shakyamuni Buddha to kill him. When the Buddha saw the food, he thought, if there is no poison in my mind, then when I eat this poison, it won't poison me. So he ate the food and didn't die. Another externalist master was jealous of Shakyamuni Buddha. Before the Buddha arrived on the scene, the Brahmins were in the majority. Everyone believed in them. After the Buddha had cultivated for six years and had realized Buddhahood, the externalist disciples went to bow to Shakyamuni Buddha. Kashyapa, Mahamaudga, Dhyayana, and Shariputra had all been adherents of externalist paths. For this reason, the externalist masters were jealous. They fed wine to some elephants, five of them, and sent to them 
so the Buddha to trample him. Who would have guessed that when the elephants approached the Buddha, the Buddha would stretch out his hand and five lions would come from his five fingers, scaring the elephants nearly to death.